Welcome to part two of the history of hockey and the founding years of the NHL. If you haven't watched part one yet, maybe just pause this right now and go do that real quick. But if you have, let's get to it. Just in case you don't remember everything from part one perfectly, here's a quick recap. Some kids in England decided to start hitting a ball around with sticks and then thought that was so much fun that they would go and do it on ice. Canadians, who have plenty of ice, decided that they liked this idea so much that they made an official game of it and started paying people to play it. Meanwhile, their leader, Lord Stanley, bought them a silver bowl to use as a trophy. For now, we'll just call that the Stanley Cup. Leagues started popping up all over the place and the owners of one of the biggest leagues decided they didn't like one of the other guys that was in their group. So they left and made their own league, excluding him and another guy who had asked if he could join. Those two say, well fine then, and start their own league called the NHA. Some players from the NHA move out west and start their own league called the PCHA to compete for the Stanley Cup, which they even end up winning a couple of times, including the first US team to win the Stanley Cup. Meanwhile, back in the NHA, a bunch of the owners get fed up with one of the other owners, so they suspend the operations of the NHA and start their own league, the NHL. Alright, now that we're all caught up, it's finally time to get started with the founding years of the NHL. Originally, only three teams from the NHA make the trip over to the NHL, as the fourth team, the Toronto Arenas, is added in order to replace the team in Toronto that the owners were trying to get rid of. But after just a few games into the first regular season of the NHL, that number will be brought down to three again, as the Montreal Wanderers were forced to close up shop after their arena burned to the ground. In the following season, though, the NHL would bring back another one of the teams from the NHA in the Quebec Bulldogs, replacing the Wanderers and bringing the league back to four teams. Meanwhile, although they had just won a Stanley Cup pretty recently, the Toronto Arenas decided to change their name to the Toronto St. Patrick's. And keep in mind that they're trying to start a whole new sports league with all of this going on and with World War I still going on in Europe. A war that a not insignificant number of the best players had gone to go help fight. But even as the war ended and those players started to come back, the struggles were far from over for this brand new league, as those players brought back with them the Spanish flu, which would end up killing one player before the season even started, and then would end up ending the Stanley Cup early that year and killing another one of the NHL's player and Canadian defenseman Joe Hall. Which is a pretty crazy story in of itself, but I have already done a video about that, so if you are curious about that 1919 Stanley Cup, go ahead and watch that maybe after this one's over. Fortunately for the NHL though, things would start to stabilize over the next few years, with really the only big change being that the Quebec Bulldogs would move to Hamilton and become the Tigers. Meanwhile, in that 1919-1920 season, the Ottawa Senators would win the first of what would be three Stanley Cups in four years, this time against the Seattle Metropolitans. In fact, things go so well for the NHL during this period that they decide to expand for the first time in 1924, adding the Montreal Maroons and their first US team in the Boston Bruins. Which, while we're on the subject of the Bruins, it is a very good thing you're watching this video, because if you left it up to Bruins fans, you would probably never hear about the fact that they're the first US team. But even with a thriving league and two new teams, the 1925 Stanley Cup would be won by the Victoria Cougars of the WHL, which had replaced the PCHL out west. However, this would prove to be the last time a non-NHL team would win the Stanley Cup, as the very next year the Montreal Maroons would end up dispatching that very same Victoria Cougars team to win the Cup. And in that 1926 offseason, the WHL would end up folding, selling some of the players from a couple of its teams to form new teams in the still-expanding NHL. With the New York Americans and Pittsburgh Pirates already having been added in 1925 in spite of the Hamilton Tigers folding, the NHL would add three more teams in 1926. With another team in New York and the Rangers, the Chicago Blackhawks, who were made up mostly of Portland Rosebud players, and the Detroit Cougars, who were named after the Victoria Cougars after having bought out their players. And now with 10 teams, for the first time the NHL would introduce divisions, with the American Division and the Canadian Division. Having their three new teams join the Bruins and Pirates in the American Division, leaving the Canadian Division to be made up of the four Canadian teams, and of course, the New York Americans. Which makes a ton of sense. And no, the Americans wouldn't be forced to pick a new name just because there is now a division with the same name as them. In 1928, the New York Rangers would become the second U.S. team and first NHL U.S. team to win the Stanley Cup, even after having lost their goalie and having to turn to their 44-year-old head coach to finish out Game 2 in goal, a game which they would end up winning in overtime. And just who was this coach, you might be wondering? Well, it was none other than Lester Patrick. Remember him? Seriously, if you don't, you really should go watch Part 1. It was in this time that the NHL started looking at its rulebook again, eventually adding a handful of new rules, some of which were first introduced by the PCHA a decade earlier. With goalies still forced to remain standing, NHL President Frank Calder said, I don't really care how goaltenders make saves, they can stand on their heads for all I care. And while doing headstands did not become the preferred strategy for goalies going forward, the phrase standing on his head did stick, and is still used today to refer to a goalie who is playing particularly well. 
In the years that followed, defense ruled the league, and games were pretty low scoring, even leading to one season in 1928 to 1929 when Canadians goaltender George Hainsworth had 22 shutouts in just 44 games. Then, fearing the game was losing some of its excitement and maybe even some of its fans, the NHL thought to themselves, huh, how could we make this game a little bit less boring and not so slow? Oh, I've got an idea. What about that forward passing things the boys in the PCHA used to do? That could work. And so for the first time, forward passing was introduced to the NHL, but that had a little bit of the opposite effect and made games a little bit too fast and too high scoring. Crap, how did the PCHA deal with this problem? Oh, that's right, they had that blue line thing. And so in an effort to balance out the game and nerf the offense a bit, the NHL introduced the blue line and the offsides rule. But just as the NHL and the game of hockey continued to grow in popularity and they looked to maintain the momentum that they had built up, the Great Depression hit, and it hit the league hard right away. In the early 30s, the struggling Pittsburgh Pirates were forced to move to Philadelphia and became the Quakers, where they would only last for one season as they and the Ottawa Senators were forced to close up shop. Fortunately for the Senators though, after missing just one season, they would return to the league, but would last only two more years before having to go back to the drawing board to figure out how to stay alive, and would decide to move to St. Louis and become the Eagles. Unfortunately though, just like the Quakers before them, the move couldn't save the team, and after just one year in St. Louis, they would fold bringing the league once again down to eight teams. But the bleeding wouldn't stop there, as the Montreal Maroons would be the next to go in 1938, and then the New York Americans just a few years later in 1942. Meanwhile, as all this was happening, the Detroit Cougars decided to try out the name Falcons for a couple of years before eventually landing on the name Red Wings under the ownership of James Norris, and then going on to win back-to-back -back Stanley Cups with that name in the mid-30s. It was just after this that the Blackhawks owner, who happened to be an extreme US nationalist, thank goodness we don't have any of those anymore, demanded that his team be built using just U.S.-born players, even though at that point in the league there were relatively few U.S.-born players even in the league, and the vast majority of the good players were still all Canadians. Predictably then, the team absolutely sucked in the regular season, but since this is the early NHL, almost all of the teams made the playoffs, so they found themselves in the mix, and then somehow went on to win the Stanley Cup, beating who else but the Toronto Maple Leafs. That 37-38 Blackhawks team is still recognized to be the only team to have a losing record in the regular season, but still go on to win the Stanley Cup. Although, that being said, the 2012 LA Kings did lose more games than they won in the regular season and still went on to win the Cup, but because of how overtime losses and NHL records work as a result, that wasn't seen as a losing season. Either way though, that 38 Blackhawks team is still definitely the worst team to win a Stanley Cup. Both on and off the ice, this period in the NHL was an absolute roller coaster. But fortunately for the league, just as the 30s came and went, so did the Great Depression. And even with another World War looming, the league was finally able to stop the hemorrhaging of teams and have the dust settle on a six-team league. With the Montreal Canadiens and Toronto Maple Leafs in Canada, as well as the Chicago Blackhawks, Detroit Red Wings, New York Rangers, and Boston Bruins in the States. Thus, in 1942, beginning the era of the original six. So I do hope that you'll join me for part three of this series with the original six. But otherwise, if you have made it to this point, thank you very much for watching. If you did like this video, do hit the like button down below. If you really liked it and maybe even enjoyed it, that subscribe button is still down there. Otherwise, I'd love to hear your thoughts and maybe comments on this era of hockey down in the comments section below. Otherwise, stay safe out there and be good to each other. Peace!